Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today. And once again, it's time for your virtual star party, which is where we hook up a bunch of uh, telescopes live into a Google Plus Hangout and share the wonder and beauty of the night sky with you. Now, joining me this week, we've got a full house again and a lot of telescopes. So this is gonna, we're going to have a great night, I think. Now, the first thing we're doing right now is uh, Mike Phillips, and this is his view of Jupiter. Now, Mike has no audio tonight, so he will just have to, like, wave or type, and we'll have to translate that information. But he can follow instructions right now. So we asked for Jupiter, and he brought the Jupiter. Oh, he's got a strange kind of low resolution. I'm not really sure what's going on. So um, who else have we got? We've got uh, a new uh, astronomer joining us this week. We've got Louis Mamakos, who is... Uh, uh, Louis, can you, can you hear me okay? Why don't you switch back so we can see what you look like, if you can do that. I think hey. I can do that. Hey, hey looky there. All right. Hi, everybody. So where are you located, Lewis? I'm in uh, beautiful out in the middle of nowhere, central Pennsylvania. That's okay. Kidding. Keystone State. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I'm far from every everywhere, uh, which gives me nice uh, dark skies, which is a... Uh, a really oh. cool thing. That's fantastic, yeah. Um, and your setup is beautiful. I, I don't know if you can, can you share that, that beautiful video of your, uh, of your telescope as well so people can sure. see? Sure. Let me see if I, there we go. Perfect, yeah. So you've got, uh, now it's not two telescopes, it's one telescope, but two it's, different views of it. So Yeah, that's right. It's one telescope, two views in the observatory. I would slew it around for you, but I'm currently gathering data from yes. something else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I, we noticed that you've got the uh, the orange tape hanging from the end of the weight on that, which I believe is clearly someone bonked his head too many times on that thing and needed to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> needed to get yes, it uh, needed to get it to uh, you know set up so you could you wouldn't hit it again that's good um all right so we've got uh Roy Salisbury who is located in uh, Las Vegas and Roy's got his view what is that Roy that is the cave nebula the cave nebula awesome what i could after that... 3 or 5 minutes <laughs> yeah well we we don't give you a lot of time in the in the virtual star party so so that's great. Um, and who else have we got? We've got, we've got evil Stuart Foreman with his uh, red light in the uh, San Francisco uh, darkness. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you look like Boltar from the original Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> Doesn't he, though? He, he does. And we got Bill McLaughlin, who is now suffering some technical difficulties, but was sharing a beautiful view of a, uh, of a cluster. And Bill well, actually, I've got in the Oregon. I've got the cluster up now. What I can't get is my own camera up, but there's nothing <laughs> much to see there anyway, so all right, I can, well, we can, I can share images. That. That's, that's all I need to do. Sure, that sounds good. Uh, so those are our astronomers for tonight, and we will keep them jumping for you. And now, uh, for the color commentary, we've got uh, we've got Nicole Gallucci, aka the noisy astronomer. Doctor, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doctor, oh, I've got Doctor Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy Cast. We've got Scott Lewis, who's going to be. Uh, are you going to be working the Stellarium tonight? Are you going to be able to? Or I know we filled I up our bottom deck. Try so to you can uh, try. Yeah. I'm like quad tasking right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we filled up the uh, we filled up the the slots for people, so we figured we'd rather have people than than Stellarium. So. Ooh, Ooh robots! Here. Yay, people! <laughs> and we've got Dr. Thad Zabo. Good who, evening. Who is uh, just chomping at the bit to get out there and actually do some observing as oh, on yeah. his own tonight? Yeah. And sing for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, so first, yeah, let, let's watch the viewership drop as we, as we launch into the <laughs> yeah. So, so just to uh, to let people know, um, there's lots of ways that you can communicate with us. Uh, the first thing you can do is you can uh, you can use Twitter if you're watching this somewhere embedded. Just use the the hashtag star party. Uh, you can watch, uh, you can make any comments if you're watching this on the event page on Google Plus. You can make any comments if you're seeing this in some stream on Google Plus. And then the last thing you can do is you can watch this over on YouTube. And uh, I highly recommend that you do it on YouTube if you want sort of a safe place that you for sure get your comments through to us. So, so that's what I uh, that's what I recommend. So we'll take we'll you know if you have questions about the gear that we're using, the techniques we're doing, uh, if you want to know more about the objects, and if you want to make any requests, if there's something that you would love to see, we'll be glad to show it to you. Now the only thing that you probably need to know is that we've got a pretty nasty moon tonight. Uh, now it's a beautiful moon. I'm going to go over to Stuart's view of it right now. So you can see it is a 
was that a pretty wax? pretty? Yeah, it's a waxing it's a, gibbous. It's a waxing gibbous, well on its way to a uh, to a full moon. So <clears throat> it is washing out the view from all the astronomers. So <clears throat> that's going to be uh, something we're going to be battling with uh, all night. So we'll keep saying this would look better if it wasn't for that moon. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah, but if I you wanna... could actually zoom in, could you zoom in, Stuart, as well, so we can just see the, the Terminator or just like along the limb? Yeah, we want to see the Terminator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to say a quick hello. Oh, I look just, at this. I just noticed a comment um, from Yancy Shirley again. Uh, the University of Arizona Astronomy Club is watching from the control room of the 12-meter radio telescope. Uh, wow. The peak tonight. So hello, everybody. Wow. That's really cool. I know really the cool. moon is, is probably not a problem for you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the sun isn't a problem for them either, right? Nope. <laughs> Cool. All right. Cool. So, so why don't we start with this view of the moon? Um, and actually, I would love to know uh, sort of how much do astronomers hate the moon? And I'll start with you, Thad. Um, you know, the thing is, I mean, you you can shoot brighter stuff with the moon in the sky. The the problem is, anytime you're you're doing long deep sky astrophotography, it's filling up buckets. And what you want to fill them up with is photons. And so the bigger the difference between the top of the bucket and your background fill level, the more detail you can get. Now the problem is when the moon's hanging around, that background fill level comes up and you get less space to play with all this incredible detail you might otherwise be able to get out of deep sky objects. So, of course, I don't want to curse the moon too much because, I mean, as soon as we're done here, I'm out of the sidewalk. I'm going to shoot it. I'm going to shoot the heck out of the thing tonight. So, um, but With a camera, not a yeah. shotgun, just to be clear. It's not well, that he hates it, it's that he loves it. And I'm just going to go to Thaz, we're going to play hearts, and then we'll shoot the moon. And... <laughs> Um, wah, wah. Wah, yeah, wah. so right, so the point being that you're getting a lot of these stray photons from the moon, which are not what you want. Right, and I mean, the thing is, typically the cameras used for deep sky photography nowadays are 16-bit, so that will allow for um, better views than you, you could have gotten previously, but you're still squeezing out so many of those potential um, levels of light that you'd be able to get under, under a really good dark sky. So, from uh, yeah, from somebody trying to look beyond the solar system, curse you, moon, for somebody who's like, oh, wow, the shadow of uh, where you go from daylight into darkness is falling over really cool areas tonight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna focus on when I set up on a, after we're done here. So, well, so a perfect do... example is. Oh, I, go ahead. The perfect example is the image I just put up. It's of the flaming star nebula, and I'd call it the flaming miserable moon nebula because you can't really see it. I mean, you can see that it's there, but it's about half as good as it would have been without a moon. Yeah, and so and so typically, you know, when astronomers are looking for a time that they want to do their observing, they they plan their whole lives around the moon. When do they typically well, have good seeing? So, so the thing is, you, you have to, to think hard about exactly what is being observed. Uh, when, when I was a grad student with Yancey, actually, out at, at the University of Texas, folks that did radio, did millimeter, millimeter, they didn't care, and their data came from Hawaii, which was very awesome. Uh, those of us that worked in the optical, I, I had an advisor for a while who was looking at extraordinarily bright stars, so he used up all of the full moon time. Uh, other teams that were looking at asteroids and other such objects, they used bright sky time. I was trying to observe a dwarf galaxy that had stars that were extraordinarily faint, so I really couldn't get good data if there was a quarter moon or fatter. And um, it, it all depends on what you're trying to do. So it's that small subsection of astronomy that is people who don't use satellites, who observe in the optical, who are stuck on the ground, um, and, and who study faint objects. So that small collection of us, we're the ones who get sad face. Uh, and then, of course, the astrophotographers who are trying to take amazing pictures. So I suspect there are more amateur astronomers who are annoyed with the moon than there are professional astronomers annoyed with the moon. But the, I'm just going back over to Mike's view of, of Jupiter here. Now, we don't get that situation with, for example, the planets. Like, the bright moon doesn't cause that much of an impact on, say, Jupiter. No. No. None at all. And, and in fact, when, you know, the, even the light pollution in a major city doesn't have that much of an impact on Jupiter or, or the moon itself if you're going to try and view them. Like, it's just so much light coming from these objects. 
Correct, which is why I can go out to the sidewalk in front of my place in Los Angeles and not have an issue with this. So, Now, one thing right. for viewers, if there's anybody watching from South America, for example, so you will notice that tonight the moon is you know, probably about 12 degrees or so from Jupiter in the sky. Tomorrow night from South America, the moon will actually occult Jupiter, meaning that it will block Jupiter, it will move in front of Jupiter for people from, from there, um, I guess it would be around 6 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow night. So if you are a viewer who's there and you have some sort of, um, well, I mean, you could watch with the naked eye. It's like, hey, where'd Jupiter go? Well, the moon just moved in front of it. But if you're watching with binoculars or a telescope, you can get this amazing close-up view of the limb of the uh, the moon starting to, to block the planet and watch each Galilean moon disappear one by one as um, as the moon moves in front and then reappear again on the other side. So, it, it, Is someone going to try and broadcast that? I'm not sure. I don't right. think we have anyone in South America who can see it. So, yeah, Who wants to send us to South America, guys? We'll yeah. Totally we'll, go. We'll Pass go. the virtual hat around. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll take the virtual plane. Um... <laughs> All right, well, so, so <laughs> you know, even though, as you said, the moon is awful, um, Lewis has got a great view of uh, a, a favorite friend here. So, Lewis, what, have you, what are you showing for us? Thanks, Fraser. That's a picture uh, or an image of M42, the, uh, the, ne the great nebula in Orion, which is a really bright object. Uh, and additionally, um, I imaged this through a uh, narrowband hydrogen alpha filter. Uh, since this is an emission line nebula, or an emission nebula, this works out pretty well, and uh, the filter tends to knock out a lot of the uh, the stray light from the moon. Uh, that's really important for me tonight because, uh, along with the moon being out, I've got some high haze, which tends to kind of diffuse the light, you know, over more of the sky than it might normally. Now, you've actually a lot of the times when we when we view uh, Ryan, you know, you get that trapezium really blowing out. And it's really much harder to see, you know, either you get like a really blown out trapezium or subtle details in the uh, in the nebula. So you kind of do split the difference pretty nicely here. Yeah, I did. Uh, I, I probably cheated a little bit and uh, I, I used a, um, a screen stretch or a, um, in uh, my image processing software to, to try and show you both the extended detail of the nebula and the trapezium, but it's still really bright and it's it's hard to capture the whole extent of, of Orion just with one image because the uh, the range of brightnesses is so large that it, it you know it, it'll saturate the detector on the one hand or not register enough on the dimmer parts on the other. So uh, often I'll take images at different lengths of exposure and combine them and get the detail. Uh, on the brighter ob objects out of the shorter exposures and uh, you know, from the more extended regions from the longer ones. Yeah, and this is one of those objects that you can do, do that HDR photography and get that, you know, get combine it together to get that really neat effect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I know Gary was doing some, some HDR work with, uh, with Orion and also the Eagle Nebula, and, it, and they look really great. Um, well, I'm going to move on to Bill's view now, and Bill's got the same object but in, in color. Same object, yeah, and I'm surprised it came out as well as it did with the moon, but mm -hmm. not bad. <laughs> See, I, to I, I warned everyone, we're all, it's all we're going to be talking about tonight. <laughs> moon, moon, moon. Um, but it's great, I, I love the, I mean, the color, you really see the purples and the, yeah, you can really see just the, the colors in the nebula. And you running, can really they're... see how excited the gas is. is oh, well, it, what's going on, Pamela? Why don't you, you just went, you just went to science, so I you better did. back <laughs> it up. <laughs> No, so so a lot of the the colors that we see are are the reds come from hydrogen being excited, and we're seeing a specific hydrogen bomber line. Blue light is often because it's getting scattered more readily, and and so there's a whole lot of scientific details that goes into the really neat colors when we do get to see them. Anytime you see green, you're probably seeing oxygen, and that's just a neat little trick to know. And then, and what's that object that's just a little above it in this image? You can see like another uh, they, little piece of nebula. They call that the Running Man Nebula. I'm trying to uh, uh, remember what number NGC number it is, but it's got to be. I mean, the Orion Nebula is 1976, so it's going to be plus or minus it's, 10 of that. So it's uh, 1977. Oh. Okay, that makes sense. 
Um, I'm, the thing is, the, the Running Man Nebula, that's a largely blue area, so that's different from the excited hydrogen atoms that we're seeing with the Orion Nebula. When you see blue, that means light is being scattered. So just like the blue in the sky, it's because of the sun emitting light in all colors, and it's the blue that gets scattered everywhere, so we see blue sky anywhere we look. Dust that is out in space will take the bluer light from stars and scatter it that way, so that's largely what we're seeing with the... Uh, Running Man Nebula there. So. Oh, look at this! So Mike is uh, Mike's panning around the moon right now for us. Yeah. I'm getting, awesome. Sorry, sorry to everyone in the star party here, but I'm getting a little bit of echo, and I'm going to try and f find out who is causing it. So don't be surprised if I uh, if I mute you randomly. I was um, wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> Serial muting happening. Yes, yes, it'll happen uh, as I as I hunt for the echo. That's beautiful. Look at this view of the moon. With from Mike, so he's oh my God. he's taken he's taken that same really high resolution or high magnification that he had with Jupiter, and now he's turned it on, on the the limb of the moon. Looks like you can just like go for a walk. You're right there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let's go for a walk on the moon, guys. Yeah. There we go. Do we have some police to play while we're doing that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Of course. Of course. Uh, uh, this Jake, has got to be the southern... Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, 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 Jake Demare said that he gets excited gas after eating dairy products. <laughs> <laughs> if it's emitting light like a nebula does, you, you've oh, got some you really... Should see a you, should, you should see it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some serious heat problems. There. But not a doctor of the sky like me and Pamela. We yes. <laughs> If you're having GI issues that's causing you to emit hydrogen, that is, hydrogen alpha lines, that's kind of bad. Is, is, that, is that plasma spelled with two S's? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so, so Skip Morrow asks, can we see Comet Ison? No. <laughs> I mean, we could. I mean, we have scopes. It's, it's really, it's like magnitude 14 or 15 right now, and the moon is very nearby where it is in the sky. So right mm. now... It would look like okay. There might be a smudge there. I can't tell. Yeah, wait till November. Then you won't be able to. If if well, I shouldn't say you won't be able to miss it. But if it does what we hope it's going to do, you won't be able to miss it. So. <laughs> yeah. God, look at this view that Mike's just panning around. It's just gorgeous. Okay. So. I, I think he was inspired by our discussion of the Running Man. <laughs> look at that. We're now running over the moon. Look I think that's Tycho. Is that Tycho? Is that Tycho? Yeah, that looks like Tycho. Isn't it too small for that? That's what I thought. Yeah, I think it's Tycho. Well, that would be Tycho, yeah. Tico As our, our Dutch astronomers had pointed out to us the one time they were hanging out with us here. Fraser, right. don't you have an app that will tell us what that is? Oh, right. So is, is oh. it you're going to help me with the shameless self-promotion? Sure. Love the transition. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, right. nice. All right, so I will, I will show this off. So we actually just updated our Phases of the Moon app. So I'll show you what it looks like. Right, and so you can move back and forth in the uh, in the phases, and this is what it is right now. This is the one that's on the iPad. We also have it for Android, but the cool thing is it's now turned into a full lunar atlas. So as you zoom in, you get all Yay. of the uh, we get all the landing sites, all of the craters, all of the seas, and as you zoom in more, more and more of them pop in. So I don't know if you can see. Why do you have in. it set for tomorrow night? He's in the morning. Okay, all right. Ah, Fraser's coming to us from the future. Yeah, yeah. I can go back to now. I can go back to now. There's okay. Good. That okay. That looks better. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so. Anyway, it's available ninety nine cents on both uh, Android and iOS. Just search for Phases of the Moon. Back to regular programming. <laughs> oh yeah. Thanks. And if any of my students Thanks, are George. watching, that's definitely a good thing to get for your uh, your Sky Journal entries. You'll, you'll Ooh, be tested on it. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> nice. I'll um, be uh, pitching it in my class too. Nice. They love it. Oh, it's pretty. Look at that. I'm gonna go back to Mike's view. Okay. I I, I gotta go. There's so many other objects. I I don't know where to yes. start. Okay. I'm gonna There's start with Roy. The rest of the universe, Frazier. Come on. Roy. Think Roy. big. Roy, what have we got? <laughs> that is a requested object that uh, before the star party, some people had requested some objects. So this is NGC 2403. It's oh yeah, spiral, yeah, yeah. A spiral galaxy in a constellation I cannot pronounce. It's a camelopardalus. There you go. Wow. <laughs> this is why we have Thad. I yeah. would never have been able to pronounce Camel that. Camel would ruin that word, yeah. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Look at that. Cool. 
That's good, given the moon, yeah. Guys, is, is that is that a flocculent spiral? <laughs> okay. It lo- no, I'm bringing it up because it actually looks kind of messy. But this is a flocculent spiral. All right. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, look what Mike's just found. He's just he keeps he's so distracting. He's like squirrel, crater. Ah, <laughs> uh, whatever, man. I'm watching the galaxy. All right, all right. I'm all right. so an extra galactic girl. That is Copernicus. Copernicus crater is right on the Terminator tonight. So you will. I don't know if we'll be able to watch, see it as we're watching tonight, but sunlight is going to start spilling into this crater over the next couple of hours, and it's That's an enormous awesome. crater. So right now we're just seeing the rim of it lit up because essentially it is having sunrise right now. If you were on this crater on the moon, the sun would be just rising for you. Ooh, while we're here, uh, Jake Damari on YouTube asked what's causing the shimmering, and that is due to the effect of our atmosphere. It's an effect we call seeing. Um, the atmosphere is actually refracting the light uh, as different temperature air blobs move around other temperature air blobs very roughly, um, and that's what causes the image to shake and shimmer like that. And that's our way of, of showing you that it's live video. So, um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> This is live, but the with the uh, with the deep sky objects, you have to do fifteen seconds, thirty seconds, sometimes a couple of minutes of exposure, so you don't get that same shimmering. Even though it's really there, it's just been added out over you know over thirty seconds yeah, that, a minute. That galaxy was two minutes. That was a two minute exposure. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, there's still echo somewhere. It's is it Scott? Do you have two 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 videos open? No. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Maybe it was Scott, actually. Hmm. The echo seems to have gone away. I'm uh, not muted. You're not muted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, I, I think so much. Okay. Because I'm not sure any of the rest of us are hearing the echo. I just oh. nuked your mute button. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, right. Well, I'm going to move to Lewis's view right now, which is, I believe, is that the Crab Nebula, Lewis? That is the Crab Nebula. That's um, the part in the Crab Nebula. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little noisy. That's also taken through the hydrogen alpha filter. Uh, oh, she's a little noisy the, too. Uh, moonlight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure which way the crab is pointed. But I'm not a seafood fan myself. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to figure out. Yeah. Well, so so this this is the discussion we were having last week where. Uh, the the name doesn't come from a time when we had photography. So this is poor souls looking through eyepieces trying to make sketches. And it's from the sketches that it looked very much like a soft shell crab, uh, just the carapace with the legs kind of tucked underneath. And and so if you think of, of Baltimore soft shell crabs, you can kind of see it, kind of. Kind no. Of blur it. I, I, blur I, I, it. I, I see an awesome supernova remnant, and that is I all see it, I see. I totally see a crab, and I even see little eyeballs on him, on the, on this, creepy. his little, his little crab <laughs> eyes poking <laughs> out from, the, from the, the side of the shell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> living on the, living on the west coast near the ocean, we got to see a lot of crabs get pinched by them as, as children. Ooh. Yeah. And Mike's now over at the edge of the moon. My, We're my diving friend. off the side. Oh, that's great. To the Chesapeake Bay, and so I had to clean a lot of crabs as a kid. So, yes, I see the carapace quite easily. <gasps> I'm going to move to... Me- no, okay. <laughs> I'm going to move to Bill's view now. Bill, what have you got? I might have muted you, Bill. I do that. <laughs> Let's see. Star cluster? Looks like a little nebula off yeah, the Yeah, I, I can't tell if it's open or closed. I'm pretty sure it's not a glob, but what yeah, open is it? Which open cluster? Maybe one in Orica. Bell. Bell. That's, that's, that's M35, and NGC 2158 is the little oh. one down below. Okay. Oh. And is it a nebula? Uh, no, Gemini. it's a cluster. No, no, uh, the, the red thing, the red thing. The red thing, yeah. It's a, let, me, let me see if I can find it here. Um, I thought I looked it up. Maybe not. No, they are both open clusters. They're yeah, both this... clusters. Yeah, both open clusters, I thought. This that's is fascinating that it's so red. It is, yeah. I, I was struck by that when I first took it here. So it's got to be older stars. I mean, unless they all maybe just there's fall some off of the main nebulosity the between us, uh, or possibly. or dust that's obscuring all but the red light. That could be, yeah. Because because old and open don't go together. Not very uh, well. No. Especially not old o- ugh. old open and tightly bound. Yes. It could just be distant, though. I mean, that's 
but yeah, old and open. You're right. That's that's. Well, why do you think so, it's old? So, why do you think it's old? Well, the sucker's too, red, so I think it's dusty. Getting into a little dust. jargon, though. What do you mean by open or closed clusters for all of our viewers? Well, closed is just a stupid word that doesn't sorry. exist. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's Close open or globular. Yes. Um, or globular. Or globular. Yes. Well, there is an awful. In Canada. There is an awful lot of dust in that area. Uh, I can show you what I'm talking about with a labeled mosaic, which is part mm -hmm. of what I'm working on. And uh, there's uh, there's there's M35 wow. down here. Yeah. And you can see the other object yeah. right, right there. <laughs> but there's a lot of dust in that area, including this right. big supernova remnant in the middle. Right. That's fabulous. So an that open cluster awesome. tends to be found in the plane of the Milky Way, along the sp in the disk, and along the spiral arms. It is a cluster of stars that has formed fairly recently on cosmological timescales. And you expect to see a lot of young stars because over time, the less tightly bound ones, they're like these beehives swarming, right? Um, will actually start to spread apart and come apart, and we think the sun uh, came out of an open cluster like that some time early in its life. When we talk about globular clusters, these are really tightly bound groupings of stars that are as old as the universe itself, and they tend to orbit outside the Milky Way, outside the plane of the Milky Way in the halo. In the halo. So yeah, when we talk about open versus globular, aka Pamela's now called them closed, <laughs> that's what we mean by the two types of star clusters. <laughs> Please forgive me, I'm running on far too little sleep because I had yes. an awesome weekend at the Midwest Women in Physics Conference up at UIUC, so so I'm coming down off of a conference high and apparently forgetting all the astronomy book. I've <laughs> so so yeah, Stuart, you yes. make sense. so Stuart, you were seeking a word in edgewise there. Um, I have uh, a a similar cluster in the same area, which is M37, um, and this is also an open cluster as opposed to a globular globular cluster. <laughs> and I love you, uh, it's it's in the it's in the same area that where Bill where Bill's was. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry. And, go ahead. Well, and the, while you're here, I also have a, just an, another view of Orion. Um, yeah, I saw that. that. I so let me just put this in real quick while I while I have the uh, hot seat here, and um, uh, oh, so it's pretty. It, it's similar, but yeah. it's you know it's this is a modified camera, uh, so you see a little bit more hydrogen alpha of uh, the wispiness, and this was um, just a 60 second exposure. So and just a single sixty-second exposure. What? Yeah. Wow. Somebody asked for the rosette. Just. Uh, oh, probably not with the moon, but. I guess yeah, probably, probably not. Was it you? I, uh, <laughs> it might have been me. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I saw it in the comments. Yeah, Lewis could probably. I, I can try it. the rosette. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And one thing That's I want to mention about fantastic um, Ryan. The two globular, or sorry, not two globular, the two open clusters we were just looking at, M35 is almost exactly in the, uh, in the sky where the sun is on the summer solstice. That's oh. pretty much right where the sun is on the summer solstice. Uh, M37 is in Auriga, which is the, the constellation next door to that. But yeah, um, so when you're showing M35, that's about where the sun is on my birthday. So... <laughs> Cool. Forget the solstice. It's Dad's birthday. That's uh, way Jim, more important. There's, Jim there's Craig just asked for drawn, Jupiter. Drawn me. So. With um, moons, even. Yeah, so Jim just asked for picky, Jupiter Jim. with, with moon. Uh, so, Mike, I don't know if you're up for that. You you were able to get Jupiter. I don't know if you want to try and get moons of, because I know you're zoomed in pretty tight. So You should actually see Mike Phillips astrophotography, some of his planetary stuff. He he does the moons. He does Europa yes. and and Io. It's amazing when you look at his pictures. So do a do a search for um uh yeah, for, for Mike's astrophotography and it's just stunning. I, I, in the back channel, he said he'll he'll try to get the moons. He'll try to get a moon. Yeah. Okay. And I, I can right. try to get the moons too. It'll won't be like because it'll be a, a single shot, but at least yeah. you can see the moons. And I'll yep. after I'm done with my current image, I'll give that a shot. Okay. All right. So there you go, Jim. Uh, Mike has been sent to try and get you some moon. So we'll see what happens. Um, now, someone is asking to see Saturn, and uh, we're not going to be able to see Saturn or Mars for another couple of, of months. When, when should we start seeing Saturn show up? April or May. April so or May. It reaches yeah. opposition at the beginning of May. So, um, so by, by May, it'll be up all night. It'll be well placed for the star party starting probably late May, I guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you where it's at right now, so. if you want to see where Saturn is. Yeah, yeah. So, Here I'm in LA, and 
it's down here. It's right in the ground. But I can go ahead and remove the ground, and there's Saturn. And it is over here. <laughs> yeah. Don't just I crank the time ahead the to 1 or 2 a.m., then you'll see it. So, so there's Saturn, yeah. everyone. It's pretty. So if we did our star parties at uh, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, we would get a nice view of Saturn. And sometimes when we get a European uh, who will join us, we can definitely see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jonas uh, says that somebody someone asked for the rosette. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I saw it. I know. I, did, I saw it in the chat. It wasn't me. Matt but, from France. It's not, but now that it's been brought it up. up, now I would like to see it. So uh, anyway, I started Lewis exposure has, on it. Perfect. Lewis has has delivered the Horsehead Nebula, and look Ooh. at that. Wow. And, and what's awesome here is that very dark, very Arabian looking horse's head <laughs> is is not caused by a lack of glowing gas, but it's actually there's so much dust and gas right there that in the optical wavelengths it's obscuring everything behind it. Now what's cool is as you move to different wavelengths, you're able to peer through this gas and it eventually becomes transparent. So astronomy is all about picking your wavelength to pick what you see. And and so what would create an, an object like this? It, unicorns. Lots of star formation. <laughs> unicorns. Okay. Unicorns. Thank star you. formation and unicorns. <laughs> I, I'm going to go with just star formation. So, so you yeah. have a collapsing cloud of dust and gas, a giant molecular cloud, if you will, that as it collapses, stars begin to form, their, their light gets scattered and... Uh, in some places, uh, you end up with a mission nebula where the gas is near a hot star. In some places, you just get the scattered light, and um, it, it all combines to create this beautiful nebula effect, and, and the dark places are the places that, in some cases, are, are enshrouding the most newly forming stars, and that's where you need to go out to the millimeter wavelengths to peer into the gas and dust and find those embers that will eventually be the hearts of stars. And but it looks like it's like a almost like a shockwave front or some kind of like wave crashing on the beach. Like it's just this line that's going from the top of the bottom of the of the image. I mean, what's giving it that linear look? Do you know? That's probably shocks. It's it's winds from stars. Um, I don't know specifically what's causing this one. But if we looked at a different scale, the linear would look less linear. It's, it's a matter of zooming in that makes it that straight line appearance. Um, but you end up with, with these boundary conditions between the, the, the gassy regions and the empty regions uh, from where shock waves and stellar winds have, have pushed the gas out or gravity has drawn it in in collapsing regions. So I and, don't know the specifics of this one, but those are the general forces that are responsible. And you can just see the, I mean, such subtle features in this photo. It's just amazing. You can see these little, almost like black, smaller versions of it higher up and down. It's quite amazing. Oh, here we go. Mike has got us a moon. Now we're going to have to check the, uh, the chat to see which one it is. Does anyone know which moon it is? That's no moon. <laughs> That's no moon. <laughs> That's a space station. Wait, the White House petition went through. They did build it. <laughs> oh, that was an awesome, awesome reply uh, from the petition there. They someone wanted to build a Death Star, and yeah. the, someone, the everyone House. on the internet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the White House responded. So this is a moon of Jupiter. Uh, Mike, Mike says he, Mike has no idea which one it is. Okay. So. It's, yeah, it's hard to tell without context. Yeah, you would need but to But yeah, you to... can really see the effects of seeing here because the image occasionally like splats out into several spots and then occasionally you get these really these these moments of really good seeing and that's the effect that the atmosphere is having. I'm going to guess it's Ganymede or Io. Well, just you can see checking Mike's comments here, it's Ganymede. So it's... you win the prize. There you go. Woo! All right. Yeah. Okay. So he's gonna he's gonna keep looking. So we'll we'll keep watching his his image to see what he what he finds. And you know, I, I know everybody loves Europa for life, but Ganymede, I think, is has its own mag. Am I correct? It has its own like magnetosphere, so it protects against all the radiation from Jupiter's magnetosphere. 
Well, I don't know. I, think it's kind of of I don't remember that one. I do know that they're starting to think that it has much Here's more interesting one. geology than, than yeah. It and it's also it's farther away from Jupiter, so it's not going to get all that. Like Europa is getting bombarded with radiation. So um, now I think we're looking at Io. And Ganymede does have a similar geologic structure right. to Europa in that I mean, right. rocky rocky core, possibly icy ocean, or mm -hmm. you know, cold, watery ocean above that, and then, then a crust on top. It just doesn't have all the tidal forces that act on Europa that cause it to crack and all the slush come up through right. the crack and keep resurfacing it. So you do get stable long-term cratering on Ganymede. Um, that you don't get on Europa, but hey, there's there's water on Ganymede too. It's just yeah. not as well yeah. publicized or as yeah. Not, and not that Europa's water is easy to get to, but you know it doesn't keep welling up on Ganymede like it does on Europa. Right. So I'm going to move back to Bill because he's he snagged something else here. Bill, what is this? Uh, this is Pac-Man Nebula, um, which is NGC. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> uh, Two eight one, I believe. And this it's a little bit faint. But, yeah. Uh, with, the moon, with the moon, but it's there. Yeah, you can really see um, it in in hydrogen alpha. Gary always uh, blows us away with this one. Well, and... What's neat is as we switch between the different objects, we're able to see that as you look through the the main disk of the Milky Way, uh, you start seeing these really dense star fields. A higher probability of hitting these nebula. Um, but when we're looking out in other regions of the sky, we see much fewer stars, either because the dust is much thicker when we're looking in the Horsehead region, or because we're looking out of the plane. And so if we were to look at a globular cluster, we'd see a tightly bound knot of, of stars in, in a fairly empty field. So Graham W. asks, uh, can anybody vouch for a Celestron 21035 Travel Scope 70 telescope? Anyone? Can you vouch for that telescope? I mean, you're pretty safe going with a Celestron in general, right? Yeah, yeah I like Celestrons yeah. in general. I just don't know that scope. Well, it sounds like a 70 millimeter refractor, portable, I guess. So I guess the question is, how travel scope is it? How portable is it? How and also, it? what are you trying to do with it? I mean, that's, that's a big yeah. thing too. And uh, we have a, a good question here on Twitter too from Alan Eggleston: Is um, what's the most typical telescope for these events? The ones you showed look like a refractor. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. And all of our astronomers here have different telescopes. And so I, I think that's what's great about it: is you have a variety of optics and detectors that you can use based on what you're trying to do with it. We've got what? Let me see. Bill, you've got a refractor. I've got um, a 500 millimeter refractor, right? And I think I've owned about every focal length and instrument in creation <laughs> from one time or the other. And Stuart has a refractor as well. I know he runs a 150. One, 140, but yeah. A 140, yeah. Okay. And, and Stuart has Jupiter and all three moons. Oh, does he? Okay, hold on. Yeah. Oh, it's showing off. There we go. Star, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's just a single shot, so you're not going to see any bands or anything like that, but somebody wanted to see all the moons in a line, and there you go. Oh, so Eric Briggs just said, avoid the, tel the Travel Scope 70. It doesn't cost much, but it's no good. Try a Celestron Astromaster. So. There you go. Yeah. So as, as we're looking at Jupiter here, uh, the, the uh, students working the 12-meter radio telescope are using Jupiter right now to calibrate their, their observations. That, that's awesome. That's the Kit Peak 12 meter? Yeah, Kit Peak 12 meter. So they're actually using a radio telescope right now to look at Jupiter. At the same time, we're looking at it. Uh, this is great. So we can see both the moon, the moons, and the uh, and the view from uh, from Mike. So this is great. Let's go back and forth. There's the moons. There's Jupiter. Um, and so speaking of telescopes that people have, I mean, Mike has a 14-inch reflector. And if I remember correctly, he said he built it himself. Yeah. So yep. that's, you know. Hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> He's super hardcore. Yeah. And then, Lewis, you've got, what is it? Is it a 14 inch as well? No, mine's a uh, 12 inch uh, Honda's telescope. It looks like a STT, but the, the mirror thing in the back is actually a rear coated lens instead of just a mirror. So hmm. it's, uh, Is that one of the AP ones or is it an Italian one? It's one of the AP ones. It's, it's okay. a, the 305. And, and what object do you have, Lewis? Uh, I'm on the Bubble Nebula. Oh, there it is. Ooh. Nice. And we, I've, I've actually highlighted the Bubble Nebula right now, so yeah. this is great. Yeah, it, it's interesting that all the different scopes that people have, it's like uh, how many different screwdrivers do you need? It's the right tool for the job. At least that's what I explained to my wife 
I only <laughs> fun having five telescopes. So. As, you, as, you hide the, as you hide the bills, yeah. yeah. A sonic screwdriver is the only screwdriver yeah. you'll ever need. <laughs> I, think, I think Peter Lake has taken it to the, uh, to the nth extreme. He's the one with the, what, the 20-inch plane wave, which is a yeah. very nice telescope. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, um, right, but before we move on, this this bubula, bubble nebula actually is a really neat example of how stellar winds can blow out. They they blow bubbles in space. Young stars blow bubbles. That's just a neat concept. Um, uh, Bill Napper on Twitter asks, any chance we could look at or talk about or 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 I H I P two six five four nine. Anybody know what that is? The designation for something. Yeah. Can you type it into the chat? Here. Uh, yeah, it's on. It's on there you Twitter. Go. It's on my it's screen. Star. It's probably an Orion, maybe. Oh, I Five, forgot that we can post the comments six, into the six, into the five, screen. Five. Yes. So there you go. All right. Um, I'm gonna move to Roy's view because there's the That's rosette. What you asked for. I didn't. I did not ask for this. <laughs> I am always happy to see it, though. See, everyone's seen the documentary I now. I know. They I know. know. Razor <laughs> loves the rosette. <laughs> so Bill and Bo Bill and Roy both have the rosette up now. It's just. Uh, oh, Roy's look at the difference. In H Alpha, yeah. Bill's is in color. So yeah, this H Alpha gives you so much nicer contrast in this kind of moon weather. Yeah. And then if you can get more photos in here, I can pull the noise out of it. Oh, no, it's fantastic. It's just beautiful. Look at that object. That's just amazing. <sighs> All right. <laughs> um, Have we had enough mooning for tonight? <laughs> Never. Okay. Well, let's, so, so, let's, okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to switch back and forth. So let's just see the difference here. So I'm going to move to Bill's view, and you can just see the subtle purple colors here. Yeah, you definitely can't see the same structure at all. So, so why are we seeing so much more when we see it from the hydrogen alpha filter than when we see the visible light? Well, the, the hydrogen alpha isn't letting as much of the light pollution through. We, we've yeah. moved to having a lot of our light pollution comes uh, from condensed sodium lights, which, which emit this very characteristic yellowy color. Now, if you can get rid of all of that yellowy color when you look at the sky, and only look at a specific shade of red in this case, then um, the the background isn't as bright. Uh, well, and of um, course, the moon is uh, basically reflected sunlight, so it's white light, and you're cutting out what 98 percent of that. So the moon, you know, doesn't interfere with it, depending on how wide your filter is. I don't know what his is. I'm using a three myself, which is really this narrow. Is a six. Um, oh, Alan. No, Asked if there are any uh, Schmidt cast grains going. Uh, you've got one, right, Lewis? Yours is a Schmidt cast grain setup, isn't it? No, it's not a Schmidt. It's it's this Honda's design. Oh, okay, it looks like okay. a Schmidt, right? And then Roy, I don't know. You've got a C8, but you also use a refractor as well, right? Yeah, I have a C8 that uh, I don't use as much anymore because I just don't like the the mirror flop, and it just doesn't really do good long exposures for me, anyways. So I use a refractor. Yeah. So most nights we we actually are mostly refractors, but tonight it just happens to be a lot of. Uh, um, sorry, most nights it's reflectors. It's like yeah. a lot of Schmidt cast grains. There's like a C8 and a C14, and so. But tonight it's uh, tonight it's glass, not mirrors. Except for except for Corey and his and his dob. <laughs> his monster dob. Well, that's still monster a reflector. Dob. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love it. That's a great. That's a great view of the of the rosette. Okay, well, I'm going to move on now. Stuart, what have you got for us? This is the Pleiades, and nice. it's a little better view than last week because I have my focal reducer on this week. So I thought I'd try to get more of it. Um, on the upper right hand corner, I think you're just seeing an artifact just from a reflection of the moon. Um, I'm trying to take another one. I'm going to try to reduce some of the noise in it so we can see it a little better. But um, you can see a little bit of the nebulosity around uh, the stars. Um, and it's about the best I can do with, with my setup at this point. Um, so there's a request here for uh, NGC 2169. I don't know if anyone can do that in Orion. Notice the 37 cluster. Um, I can cool. try. Yeah? Okay. And NGC what now? 
Uh, it was it was NGC twenty one sixty nine. Okay. Yeah. NGC what now? Twenty one sixty nine. Fantastic. Um, you should name so, a nebula that. Uh, Anthony Trust. Yes, we're taking a request. Uh, just type what you want to see, and we'll try to bring it up if it's in the sky. All right, I'm gonna. Um, so a couple of other comments. Someone asked if the people at the observatory could share their photos. Uh, they're using a radio telescope right now at Kitt Peak, if that's the group you're talking about. So uh, not not exactly. I <laughs> can't exactly show pretty pictures from, from the single dish. And somebody asked if we had any updates from the Pope scope. Now, last week, um, Ray Sanders was using uh, the VAT telescope, or the VAT, um, to do some astronomical observations for his research project. And last I heard, he and the postdoc he was working with are caught up in some kind of proposal hell, and so they didn't actually get the data reduced. And so we don't have an, an, any images updated for that yet, uh, but I'm sure Ray will share that with us as soon as they get to it. It was amazing to see just even seconds of light from that professional class telescope. Yeah. We definitely need one of those back joining well, us. And, and we do have a professional scope that wants to test out whether or not it can work with us. And, and it's just going to be a matter of a, the Sarah Observatory, one of its observers, oh, has contacted us. So that would be a matter of when the observer has time if it coincides with the star party. Trying I'd like them to connect up a DSLR and just show a live view. What I want to see is I want to see the Orion Nebula doing the, uh, you know, if we see the Orion Nebula jumping around the screen like we see Jupiter, then then we'll know we've made it. <laughs> eh, it's not that impressive. Because <laughs> it's From, far, uh, already a fuzzy object no, to start no, but, with, you but know? Then, but then yes, we I, I can, get, I get we you, can I get run you. the light for a long time. That's all I'm no, saying. I, I get you. I get you. I'm going to move to, uh, to Bill's view of uh, Andromeda. It that. is. It is indeed. Yes. Oh, that's nice. What? Also, just want to pick up. We've got a comment from uh, Paul Murphy. Can you find Proxima Centauri? Unfortunately, no, because nobody in our astronomers is south of 20 degrees uh, north latitude. Proxima Cent and Alpha Centauri are only visible from. I can. I know you can see them from Puerto Vallarta, but <laughs> I don't think anywhere north of there really. So. Apparently, we should have been able to see it from the cruise when we were Probably, going. Probably, yeah. Yeah. But it was it wasn't gonna come up till four in the morning. We we checked the right. the sky right. charts and yeah, we wouldn't see that to till four in the morning. So So you didn't stay up? Lame. No. no. Party or are you? Lame. The one who took his children. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Just keep them up too, then they'll be tired yeah. all day. They won't. Yeah. <laughs> um someone talk about this galaxy before we move on. It's pretty. It's, it's light. It's, it's light that we're seeing was released about the same time that the early Homo sapiens start, not Homo sapiens, the Oma, early Homo erectus started walking on the Earth. And it is also headed our way and it's got crashed into us. It's coming for us! So, we're billion billion years. so it's not like it's stalking us, it's like we're both stomping towards each other gravitationally in a spiral bound trajectory. Yeah. Oh, they're, just, they're pretty much head on actually. They, they discovered yeah. recently that there's almost no really? um, proper motion on the sky of Andromeda. They used ha ha radio telescopes to do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. surprise, but yeah, surprise. there's almost no proper motion on the sky. It's coming right for us. Okay, so but then we're coming direct. right at it as well. It is yeah. mutual gravitational force. It is mutual, yeah, stomping. Now, <laughs> doomsday preppers, don't worry. You have four billion years to worry about. <laughs> five, about. depending. So, yeah. I want to see the massive amounts of star formation. I want to be around for it. I think it would be cool. The stars aren't going to collide. I'm not worried about that. Right. I want to see the massive amounts of star formation that's going to happen when all the gas smashes together. But, but in the interim, you can look at the mice, the tadpoles. They're good examples. Yeah. And there's a planetarium show called Cosmic Castaways, which I got to, to narrate, which was awesome that I'm hoping tomorrow I'll be able to get posted up online and it tells the story of this future collision and cool. the stars that will get cast out and find themselves without a home galaxy. Now, have we decided on the final name for what this new object will be called? I uh, think Milk Dromeda. Milk Dromeda is, okay. is, is the favorite. Because yeah. I am yeah. down, I, I do not like Milko Media. <laughs> no, I haven't like heard Milk that one before. No, 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 Milk Dromeda. Milk Dromeda, okay, yeah. Um, uh, so, Bill, while you're there, can you get grab M33? Somebody wanted to see that. I will go and move to it now, right? Yeah, now. it's pretty close to you, to M. Yep. That will also I'm, join I'm, in the merger. I'm actually doing madness. 33 right now. Oh, are you doing 33 now? Okay, well then, someone else asked for M. <laughs> That's showcasing this, his shirt. This is M33. 
<laughs> now, okay, so someone asked up. for um, M31, sorry, M81 and M82. Now, is that that's getting hit by the moon, isn't it? Uh, no, yeah. it should be up uh, oh. more to the north. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, go, I'll go. Yeah, I'll go look for it. Degrees. I'll okay, go, I'll go look for it. See if I can get it behind the tree. Okay, <laughs> I've I got the twenty one sixty nine. Um, this, this is the NGC twenty one sixty nine that somebody wanted. It's, it's, oh, off. Oh, so great. Great. oh, look at that. And Lucy, is that the Eskimo? It's another open cluster. This one's an Orion. It's the um, thirty seven cluster, but um. It was discovered by William Herschel, which means it was probably oh, yeah. also discovered by his sister, which is kind of cool. Just turn your head about 120 degrees this way, and there you go. 37. Oh, yeah, totally. You're right. You can't see the number 37. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's my 37 is oriented right ways up, so uh, you don't have to twist your head around. Am I not seeing it? I'm oh, there it is. It. Okay, so I've, yeah, I've moved Lewis. Lewis has got the view, too. See? Look at Am that. I going the wrong way? Three. Yeah, you're going the wrong way. Seven. That's amazing. If we had a five cluster somewhere, we could have 42. <laughs> yes, we could. And then we'd have the ultimate answer. Oh, so we have see. never, we have never, never seen this before. Thank you so oh, much for suggesting that's cool. it. Yeah. That just made our day. <laughs> oh, I see it. <laughs> look, at, look, at, look at Lewis's view. Look at I'm Lewis's like, view. No, right yeah. Totally no, but look okay. at Lewis's view. It's, it's he's got it oriented perfectly. Yeah, but it shows it shows um, it's yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I saw Stewart's view first, and there's that one very bright bluish white star, and that was making me think because I know like the, yeah. the Eskimo Nebula and the blue snowball look kind of like that, and then it was yeah. like, oh wait, look at the bigger picture a little bit. It's number thirty-seven. Oh. Oh. You should see it more clearly, but with greater rotation. I see. That's I terrific. see. The, it's colorful. It's colorful. What a great object. <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited. All right. That is pretty amazing. Look at that. Wow. You know, Nicole, you can pick up your laptop and rotate your laptop. I have too many yeah. things plugged into it. I can't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figured that's funnier. Um, so what was the designation of that again? Just so we all know. And it was, would be um, 2169. There you go. What a great object. Thank you so much for recommending that. Yeah. Wow. So we put that on our hit list somewhere so we can come back to that. So whoever keeps track of this. It's you, isn't it? <laughs> you <check> yes. It. <laughs> that would be your job. <laughs> All right. I, I'll tell you what I want to see. I want to see the number 37 written in the sky. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, okay, well, I'm going to move on. Uh, ooh, what do we got? Mike's got a moon. Thanks, Mike. Question being, which one is it? Uh, Lewis is going to show his telescope slewing. Ooh. Which is awesome. I know. I feel like I'm watching my speckle in a ferrometry lab from first year grad school all over again <laughs> when I see this moon jumping around. And then Bill brought up another um, another cluster. Yeah, that's M34, not too far from the other ones. Another standard open cluster. <laughs> another standard open cluster. What? I, I, boring. I don't see any numbers in there. Not boring because okay. So if you make an HR diagram out of it, which means you plot the the color of it or the temperature versus the brightness of the stars, you can tell how old the cluster is, uh, and and I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And and the nice thing Science. about these is you do get to see the younger, more metal-rich stars as compared mm -hmm. to the globulars, which are the older, metal-poor stars. So this is some place where planets are potentially forming, have formed, as compared to a globular, where they're just naked stars. Darn you kids and your heavy metal. <laughs> well, you know what? We're, <laughs> we're, nearing, um, we're nearing the hour, so I think we'll start to, to wrap things up. So if anyone we're has some final silly. objects, I know, I know Roy is trying to get us a, a view of of uh, M33, but there's a few things coming up that we should probably let people know about. So number one, uh, next week, because we're starting to get light, the, the earth is tilted and the seasons are shifting, so we're going to have to start a little later. So we'll probably start at 6.30 next week as opposed to 6. Right. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is we're going to be recording Astronomy Cast tomorrow, Pamela, at noon. Well, 2 p.m. Central, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 right. p.m. London, choose a time zone. And we chose a topic, but I forget what topic we chose. Yeah, I don't remember either. 
How could we have forgotten our topic? What? All right. I'm, I'm going to guess it's space related. Something space related. It's, it's on related. our Google event. So if you go I... check out our Google event, which is, I think, attached to Fraser's. I haven't made an event for this episode, though. <laughs> So, then it doesn't mind. work. All right, we, we need to fix this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just schedule. It's just... Anyway. Um, yeah, okay. So anyway, we're going to be recording an episode of Astronomy Cast tomorrow. Uh, yeah. It's on astronomy, guys. Stay it's tuned. It's about astronomy. <laughs> Um, so something, that's going to be at something. noon, and so that's, you know... For oh, phases wonders. of matter. We were doing phases of matter. Oh, oh okay. There you go. Phases nice. of matter. Can I join? So, Scott, can I please can join? Can the event? And in the after show. Yeah, Dad. you want to join that? Yeah. Yeah, no, because I mean, before I was I was doing condensed matter physics before coming back to astrophysics. So, oh yeah, I, I got a lot of good. Yeah. Everyone, you should come watch. It'll be a gas. Special <laughs> gas. <laughs> or a plasma. Die. Yeah. Um, Die. And then and then what else is happening this week? We've got um, the education on Wednesday. Yeah, we have this the first ever uh, what do we call it? Learning space. We're learning space with CosmoQuest. We'll be talking about science education, uh, you know, specifically astronomy and space, but we'll branch out to all topics. And I promise to launch the show by actually launching something. Uh, yes. so we're gonna do a little science nice. demo for I you have guys. a box of rocket engines. Excellent! <laughs> Projectiles. Was, yeah, we're going to launch things, and it's going to be awesome. Larry asks when the Astronomy Cast episodes that were recorded on the cruise are going to be dropped in the feed. There's actually five episodes in editing right now, so they're going to come out fast. Yeah, we got an email from Preston earlier today. I think they're almost done. Yeah, so they're gonna, th there's going to be a big pop of episodes shortly. So, And we got a couple to catch up, but we're actually not that far behind. I think we're like two weeks behind, but... But you just don't see it in the feed because they, they're all in editing. So they'll be coming out soon. Promise. Uh, Thursday, I think, what, Planetary S Society yeah, does Planetary their... Yeah, Planetary Society. Yeah. Uh, so I, Emily Lactawalla usually hosts that, I think. Yeah. I don't know what the topic is. Or Matt is Kaplan. Or Matt Kaplan, right. And then Friday we have the uh, the newly returned uh, Weekly Space Hangout. Yeah. That's right. So we, we have a whole down. week of programming for you we guys. We do, yeah. Yes. It's crazy. And there's more to come. There's more to come. More, just more wait for all those cats. Yes. <laughs> yes. All those cats need to be heard. All herded. those cats. All Heard the those cats. cats. Let's look at um, galaxies. All right. So I'm going to move through these final objects that we've got now. Roy, as requested, has brought up M33. Word. Yeah, and I, I have a question about this. This is is listed as like magnitude 5.9. How is it measured? Is it measured from the center brightest spot, or is it a combination? Integrated. Really integrated. Okay. Take all the light never... smush. Yeah. Okay. Jinx, you owe me a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and Lewis has got... M81. M81. Yay! That's great. And I know that Bill also had M81 and M82. M81, Yay! M82. And if you look at the one up by the cursor here, that is NGC 3077. Ooh, and, and then one down of the and then one yeah. down there, and that is uh, NGC two nine seven six. You've got a really wide field of view. Yeah, you do. That's that's, awesome. that's an astronomy compliment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 Is that, is well, I, you know, the thing is, you can also have a compliment that says, man, you've got a big mirror, which means you've got a small field of view. Yep, yep. <laughs> well, you can build both. You just have to fold your light quickly. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let me uh, let me sort of wrap things up then. So, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much to uh, to Bill. I know you were uh, you were battling the moon, but now it's it's really coming through. So, thank you very much. And to Lewis, uh, good job, rookie. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. uh, you uh, yeah. you did a great job, and uh, you brought some beautiful images. And what a wonderful telescope! You are welcome anytime. Um, yeah. And thanks to Mike, ending on a moon, which. Uh, who knows which moon that is? He, you know what? Mike will provide, I'm sure, an image of it, and and you'll see how good a job he does with the the planetary photography. Yeah, so, follow but, Mike on Google Plus. Yeah, yeah, so definitely Mike follow awesome. Mike, and uh, and we'll try and sort of. I know Mike will upload some images to the uh, to the hangout, and you'll you'll get an email of it, so uh, so you get a chance to see all the images that everybody uploaded. And reminder. For, to everyone who is participating and even people who are watching, by all means, upload images about space and astronomy and what we did tonight uh, into the Hangout, and you can see all the photographs. That'd be great. 
Thanks, Roy, for the uh, for that uh, M33 at the end there. I really appreciate that. That was great. No and problem. all the other images. So, um, And Stuart with your 37. That's okay. great. Thanks. Fantastic. Yep. All right. And so, and then to the color commentary, folks, thanks, Nicole and Pamela and Scott and Thad. Now, Thad, you're free. You can go out and get that telescope going. And, uh, yeah, go get go some free. Right now. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see you all. We'll see you all next week. Wonderful show. This was really great, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>